This is the Redemption Church Podcast. For a list of messages, events, sermon notes, and more, please visit experienceredemption.com. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Here is today's message. All right. So we are in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we're calling this series Insurrectionist. And uh, the term or the title is really, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, particularly right now is all we hear about uh, or a lot about is insurrection and all this kind of stuff around the world here, everything like that. Um, and so we pick this uh, just because it kind of uh, depicts this kind of ironic idea. Uh, the ironic idea being that the First Thessalonian or the church in Thessalonica was accused of turning turning the world upside down as being insurrectionists. And then we're studying, well, what did they do as insurrectionists? Did they, uh, did they riot? Did they start a fight? Did they beat anybody up? Did they kill anyone? Did they try to take over? Nope, 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 nope. They didn't do any of those things. Uh, what did they do? Well, that's what we're looking at. And we're kind of seeing what is this pathway to insurrection? What are the traits underneath? In Acts 17.5, it says that they turn the world upside down. And so we're asking a pretty simple question question. How do you be a part of something that turns the world upside down? Last week, uh, my dad taught, and I thought he did a great job of um, re-looking at Acts 17.5, because really, the the world said they turned the world upside down, but we know that the the world was actually being turned upside or right side up, Uh, that the world is naturally upside down. It's upside down because of sin. It's upside down because of brokenness, and uh, God is in this great cosmic plan of redeeming his world. Romans, remember, tells us uh, that creation itself groans. It's waiting in eager anticipation, right? Our bodies are waiting in eager anticipation for the full redemption to come. Uh, But in the meantime, from now until final redemption, uh, which will be a theme, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians when we get closer uh, to the end of it, uh, Christ's return and the second coming and these types of things. But from now until then, uh, what role do we play in right-siding the world and bringing redemption? redemption uh, to our lives and to our families and to our city and, uh, and all of those types of things. And then whatever way God would call us to bring redemption out to the world. And so that's the idea here around insurrection. And uh, here's two things we've learned thus far. Uh, in week one, we learned uh, w- that where you start insurrection can matter. Paul picked Thessalonica for a reason. If you remember back to week one, uh, Paul arrived in Thessalonica because he had heard a vision of somebody who had told him to go to Macedonia, and Thessalonica was an important part in the region of um, Macedonia. And so Paul ends up in Thessalonica. It's this big town, uh, one of the more powerful, prominent cities in the Roman Empire, um, filled with history, uh, filled with all of these natural or practical reasons why, if, uh, if, if Thessalonica came to Christ, why it would have a resounding impact. Uh, one of my favorite conversations with people, um, particularly, actually, it doesn't matter if they live in Toledo or if they live not in Toledo. Uh, when I have conversations, though, with people outside of Toledo, uh, you know, most of them have never been here. Well, this little conversation, these are pastors, right? Or, uh, you know, some of them don't even live in the country. And they're like, well, you know, Ohio, tell me about it. All of that kind of stuff. And I know we all kind of weirdly wear this, like, badge of honor of, like, oh, Toledo, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, and, but, though, you know, recently, I think it's, it's been on the upswing a little bit, which is great. Uh, and I think we're just enjoying, you know, low housing prices, all things considered, right? And, and we're seeing the value of this. But one of the things that I always say to people outside of Toledo is this, uh, that what I love about Toledo is that it is small enough where you can accomplish just about anything. And it's actually big enough that it matters. I think last I looked in the last census, well, we were like the 59th or 60th largest city in the country, right? Uh, and so 60, I mean, that's pretty good, right? Uh, but we all know this, like we're all three people away from knowing everybody in town, right? I was with somebody the other day. They said, I've learned in Toledo, you can ask three questions. And at that point, you'll have a connection. Uh, what year were you born? Where did you go to school? And what part of town did you live in? I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much, you will find a connection there somewhere if you do that. And so uh, what I love about Toledo, what I've always loved about Toledo, again, is small enough that you can do anything. It's big enough that it actually matters. Uh, and, and so where you do insurrection matters. That's what we, we talked about in week one. In week two, um, my dad just walked through a, a whole bunch of traits of insurrectionists. So like he did last week repeatedly, I will repeat his points 
tonight. So what do insurrectionists do? They go to God first. They work hard or they labor in love. They operate as a family. They have the power of God's word. They um, have strong leaders. They set a tone for other people or an example for other people. They get results and they keep the end in mind. That's what insurrection is. That was a great teaching and a great filter for us uh, to say, okay, if I want to be a part of this, then I got to fit in the, those categories. That's what an insurrectionist does, right? Uh, and, and so that's, and that's the point of why we're kind of like just slowly teaching here through 1 Thessalonians um, this semester so we can learn from them. What did they actually do to, uh, to, to turn the world upside down? Now, today, what Paul's going to talk about, he's going to kind of transition. And uh, I want to make sure I get everybody uh, going along with me here as I go through these next few verses, um, these next eight verses, because you might be able or think for a second, like, does this really relate to me as an individual? And I would say, well, it does, because all Scripture does. But what Paul, uh, the title of this section is Paul's Ministry to the Thessalonians. And, and so uh, what Paul is doing here a bit, not quite the way he does it in 1 Corinthians when he really goes to town and he's like, defending himself and all of this kind of stuff. But Paul here is, he's defending his ministry a bit. He, he's saying, this is how I operated. This is how I acted. Now, there's a couple of ways on why this relates to you. Number one, uh, because it shows you what you should expect in a healthy way of people in ministry. And that's a good thing for you to know. Uh, and so you can look in here and go, okay, what is normal? Uh, or maybe not normal. Normal is probably the, the, the worst word to use, actually. Okay, what should should be normal. What could I expect from people in ministry? Okay, number one. Number two, um, there's oftentimes where Paul says, hey, imitate me as I follow Christ. And so all of us, from me uh, to our elders to, to each and every one of you, can look and say, okay, uh, there's got to be something in how Paul operated as a leader that has great value for us. Uh, as individuals in, in the body of Christ. That's number two. Number three, a uh, third reason I'll say this is why this relates to you, uh, is that most of us have some level of influence or leadership in our life. We're, we're probably leading um, something or we have some level of influence, right? And it's not a perfect comparison in leading in the church to like leading, you know, wherever it is, uh, Burger King, wherever it is that you do, right? But there is enough value and understanding and then applying these traits into our uh, context, right? And then I'll give you one more. The fourth reason why I do think this is valuable as well is, uh, you've probably heard this, that the best leaders, right, were once good followers. The best leaders were once good followers. That, uh, that, that, that there's a way of um, learning uh, from a leader and going, okay, well, uh, if that's what the leader does, then I'll just act like that, right? And, and that's either training me or it's really helping participate or create movement wherever you're at. And so that's why I think all of this is very relevant. So uh, last week we did a lot of insurrectionists do this as individuals. Today, a little bit I'm going to talk about is um, how do insurrectionist leaders operate? How do insurrectionist leaders operate? And so I'm going to pull those things out here um, this, this evening. And uh, we'll just kind of do it a little bit verse by verse. Let's start with the first one. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. Okay, here's my first point. Insurrectionist leaders are effective. They are effective. When Paul says that you, that are coming to you was not in vain, uh, here's a little bit of what he means. His point in verse 1 is that they didn't just show up with smoke and mirrors. The three of them, remember, Paul, Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy, um, that when they showed up, they actually accomplished something. It's normal for people. I don't know why this particularly happens in ministry, but it is normal for people to pretend like they're being effective when they aren't actually being that effective. And what Paul is saying here, he says, guys, when we showed up, it was not in vain. It was not smoke and mirrors. It was not a bunch of tricks to make you think that things are going well when they weren't really going well. Have you ever heard like a ministry pitch? Uh, maybe it doesn't even have to be a ministry pitch, but it, it could be something else, uh, right? But it, we'll talk about the ministry context. And, uh, and maybe you're listening to the pitch and, uh, and you're trying to hear them. Uh, and then you hear it. And then you hear it five years 
later, then you hear it 10 years later, then you hear it 20 years later, and at some point in time, you're scratching your head, and you're like, wait, that's like the same thing I heard 20 years ago. Like, what's happened in the last 20? Like, isn't there another story to share? Like, it, God, God has to have done something in the last 20 years, right? Uh, and, and, and sometimes you'll hear this, right? You, you'll hear this. Guys, this is a funny one I heard once, okay? Th- this would connect. I was down in West Virginia. Um, we had family in West Virginia, um, and that's where my dad grew up. And or he didn't grow up. Well, kind of. He was born around there. And then, uh, and then we'd go down there every summer. And I was down there once by myself, and uh, I just went down there to climb and, you know, all that kind of stuff and hang out in the house. And So anyway, I went to church, and, um, and I went in there, and the pastor got up, and um, I, I just went to any church I was close to, and this was about as Baptist, West Virginia Baptist, as you could possibly imagine, okay? And so I snuck into the back row, and I was listening. The guy gets up there, and he was talking about VBS, and he was talking about VBS with more fervor, right, than any person I've ever heard talk about VBS. But listen, guys, I, I'm just like, I'd been doing ministry for a while. I could see what was going on in this room, and this guy's talking about, like, you know, these kids, and they got, they got saved, and all of this kind of stuff, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, okay, these have to have been the same kids who came last year. And they had to have been the same kids who came the year before. And they had to have been the same kids who came the year before. And he's like trying to like rile everybody up. And the crowd was just dead, by the way. I mean, dead. Like when I watched that worship service go, it was like forever implanted in my head because of how angry every man in that building was, right? While, they, while church was going down. And, and I thought to myself, like, this is, this is, this is having a negative effect like you're trying to you're trying to champion like some great success and everybody is seeing through it. So Paul shows up into Thessalonica. He says, "Guys, you know we didn't do that. We didn't come spinning some magic story. We didn't come saying uh, and bragging about every story and oh you got to believe this and, blah, blah, and like oh this happened and and you're like how come every person that comes to Christ in your church like like literally was worse than the prodigal son right you're like, like like every story and Paul's like we did not do that what did we do Paul says he says we just came in and we were effective in other words the proof was in the proof was in the pudding. We let, we let the results speak for themselves. We let the results speak for themselves. And I think this is important across all of our lives, right? We live in such an age right now, whether it's social media um, or, or just in conversations with people where um, we, we, we like to one-up each other. Um, I hope you never get caught up into this, like, church-upping each other. Right? Where it's like, oh, well, yeah, here's what's going on in our church. Here's what's going on. And you, right? And, and, and just like, just let the results, Paul's saying, let the results speak for themselves. Sometimes I'll talk to people and they're like, man, you got to tell more story. You got to post it on your social media and you got to talk about the money you guys give away and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, no. Just let the results speak for themselves. Let God move. Don't come in vain. Don't smoke in mirror. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. So that's Paul's first point. Now he's going to tell us that it's not easy. Because look at what he says in verse 2. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Paul's like, you guys know how bad it's been. You know how hard it's been. People were telling stories. Um, We suffered. We had been shamefully treated. Um, And it was such that everybody was like, they were spreading it around. And um, I've been fortunate enough to hear some of these stories lately. Um, I did a a, a live show on Tuesday with a guy. He's a pastor uh, outside of London. And he he was uh, fired by his, get this, he was fired by his evangelical college okay? Um, And the reason he was fired is because he refused to not affirm gay marriage as biblically faithful. And so they fired him. And so here he is. This is one of the leading evangelical colleges in uh, in, um, Great Britain, Great Britain, right? Okay. And and here he is now. He's just fired. And and like, we had lots of conversations. Like, was there anything else? Like, did you secretly like 
beat somebody up? Like, did you, you know, like, did something? No, he's like, no. Um, and, and so now he doesn't have a job. And so um, I'm having this conversation with him. And, uh, and then I was having another conversation with another guy. I mentioned this the other day. Uh, and, and just he's telling me about, he's like, dude, Australia is so screwed up. And like, you guys don't even know. You are so lucky. He's like, I've been watching your guys' politics. I love your politics. He's like, he's like um, Kamala Harris would be like our Donald Trump. Yeah. He's like, I'm not kidding. He's like, it's so much worse than you could possibly think. He said, and here's the crazy thing. People think, they're like, oh, politics don't matter. He's like, do you know how bad it is? He, he's like, there's not a, per he said, I can name like nine pastors in Australia who aren't afraid to preach the gospel anymore. What? Because they'll, they'll take your money. They'll send you to jail. He said, our churches are dying or they've had to just completely give in. He's like, so tell those crazy people over there who don't think it's matter. Like, you're our last hope. You are our last hope. He's like, I'm looking at our political choices. Yeah, this is what he said. He said, like, you're right. Kamala Harris is our right wing. Said, then it just gets worse. He's like, and this is for real. He's like, I live in it every day. He said, and by the way, if they still don't care, it, in America, it costs, uh, average houses 4X your, the average income. He said, here it's 16. So that would be like in Toledo, the average house price being $800,000. Okay. He's like, so it matters. He said, and guess how much people are able to give in Australia? Nothing. He said, the church is broke. The church is broke. We can't, we can't do anything. The government took all of our money. He's like, so no one's going into me. He's like, it's impossible, right? So he's like, warn all the crazy people. I'm like, okay, all right. Um, but, but I'm chatting with him, and he's like, I've, he's like this, this suffering, like, we, I, can, I can share this. I've heard it, right? You can see how bad it is. By the way, I was like, dude, where's Hillsong on this? Because I was super curious, right? Because I'm like, hey, that's Australia. Everybody knows this. We sing their songs. We just sang at least one. It might have been two, right? I was like, where's Hillsong? Just out of curiosity on that. He's like, oh, dude, those guys are straight up communists. I was like, seriously? He's like, yeah. He's like, they play really good conservatives when they go to America because they know what they're doing. He's like, but those dudes are straight up commies. I was like, dang. I was like, we'll probably still sing the song, but man. I was like, I'm not going to another concert. Man. That's sad, right? Okay. Um, it's the kind of suffering that Paul faced was the kind that went out, that people talked about. It's the guys in Australia. It's the guys in Europe, right? Uh, it's my friend in St. Louis right now that the IRS is suing them um, because they held a school rally um, against transgender bathrooms in, a, in an elementary. Okay? And now the IRS is, is, is suing them and threatening to take away their tax-exempt status, which isn't going to happen, but the IRS just likes to mess with you. Right? Um, it's that kind of stuff. Paul says, though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, he says, you know it was hard. You know we were facing a lot. But what did they have? He said, we had boldness. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Insurrectionist leaders have grit, courage, and boldness. And insurrectionist followers, people in the congregation, must have the same. It's easy to quit, give up, give in, and look for something easier. It is. But Paul says, we had boldness in our God, and I would suggest it is really only boldness when it is in the midst of much conflict. It's not boldness when there's no conflict. It's not boldness when nobody cares, right? It's not boldness when, when, when there's no threatening on the other side. It is boldness when there is. He says, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Much conflict. Grit, courage, and boldness. And who knows where, the, regardless of what happens in November, who knows what the future of our country looks like? And, and it's funny, because whenever I say that to either a European or an Australian, you know what they say back? They say, I know what it looks like. I can tell you exactly what it looks like. 
We're living in it right now. People will start getting arrested. Churches will start closing. The gospel will go down. The idiots who think that persecution is somehow helpful for the church will be proven wrong. He goes, and you'll live in a godless society like I do. He says, that's what will happen next. Okay. Along the way, and hopefully, obviously, we're praying that doesn't happen, right, um, is, is grit, courage, and boldness in the midst of much conflict. In the midst of much conflict. Now, I think it's funny when you compare, like, 20 years ago in American evangelicalism, what we thought conflict was, right? Um, what, what, we're like, oh, it's just been a hard season, right? And, and, and like, in the, in, the, in the heightened time of, like, celebrity Christianity, right? And, 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 you know, every church that opened its doors grew to 2,000 in, you know, 19 minutes. And, you know, like, in that phase, right? Like, like you know, what we thought conflict was versus, um, and to some extent, it might be good to us, right? Um, on, on to understand what conflict means a little bit more because hopefully it'll drive something out of us. It'll make us not take for granted what we have, right? Um, but like true, real conflict. Um, okay, I, th- I saw this Instagram video. Actually, Lindsay sent it to me. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, and so we're going to show it in a second. And the reason I want to show it, it's just kind of funny. But, but I, I think it can kind of take on the mindset of um, sometimes uh, uh, that we have as Christians. Uh, and so, I don't know, whatever. Let's just watch it. It's Wednesday night. We can do whatever we want. She would make us the best breakfast. She didn't buy strawberries in winter. They were like $10 a punnet. She'd dress us in beautiful clothes and play games with us. But then... <laughs> she would say she needs five minutes to get ready and go to her room and get dressed and just leave us in the lounge room with all of our toys that were so expensive for her to buy. And one time she told us she needed to go to the toilet and she even shut the door and we couldn't even sit on her lap. I've never felt so alone. (laughs) Okay, that's great. And if you missed the beginning, what's going on here is this woman is making a funny video of her kids in therapy someday in the future. And the biggest complaint, right, is that they, um, she took five minutes to get dressed by um, herself and made the kids play with their expensive toys by themselves for five minutes, right? Um, goodness gracious. It, it's, it's, we laugh because it's, it's true, right? Like in this, in this like softened world that we live in, right? It's not hard to imagine this. And somebody could make like a Christian version of this, right? To like, we went to this church for five years and they didn't even give us coffee, right? Okay. All right. I promise you somewhere somebody is at a different church right now sitting down with a pastor and they're like, so where'd you come from? Redemption. Is it true they don't even give you coffee? Yeah, he's such a tightwad. I hated him. Like, First Peter, chapter one, verse six through nine. So I say to our, I say this to our, I say this to the high school students whenever I get a chance to pop in, or I say to our Revere students a lot: You're not a victim. Like, if you literally can just understand that you're not a victim, your, your chances of success, you're going to 10x outperform everybody in today's world. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Toughen up is what it's saying. Saying toughen up, and when you face the tough times, you have an inexpressible joy. It, 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 it's, 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 uh, notice what it says. It says the tough time actually shows the genuine nature of your faith. Isn't that a isn't that a great reminder? It's like it's saying this. Okay. 
you can live your life and go, I'm a Christian, 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 I'm a Christian. The tough time comes, now you actually know. It's saying in the tough time, if you go, no, I'm not, then what it's saying is, you never were. You never were. You thought you were. But you weren't. When did you know it was genuine? If you have a fake $100 bill, and you go, it's real, 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 it's real. Treasury, treasury agent looks at it and goes, no, it's not. Was it ever real? It was always fake. You can walk through all of your life. It's nice, it's easy. I'm a Christian, 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 I'm a Christian. Gets hard. That's when you know. That's when you know. Paul was saying, Paul was saying, okay, he said, guys, we showed up. It was the kind of bad that people talk about. It was the kind of bad that, that a pastor has a conversation with a pastor in Australia and then tells his church on Wednesday night about it. It was that kind of bad. That kind of bad. Like, really? So much. It was spreading around. But you know that when we showed up in that, that we still had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of real conflict. Not, you know, according to that video, 2045 therapy conflict. Real, real conflict. Where you stick at it. We press in. We stay faithful. You stay bold. You keep preaching the truth. You don't back down. Said so insurrectionist leaders, they got to be. You got to have some grit, some courage, and some boldness. And friends, we all do. We all do. Let's keep going. Verse three: For our appeal does not spring from air or impurity, or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our heart. Insurrectionist leaders and therefore followers should operate with integrity. Here's what Paul is saying here in verses 3 and 4. He's saying, check my record. Check my record. The, again, the proof is in the pudding. He's like, look at the evidence. Look, look, at, look at the evidence. I was reading a passage this morning. I have a phone call coming up with somebody, and I was like, I don't know if I trust this person. I don't know. And I was reading this morning uh, in Matthew chapter 7 where it talks about um, that a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. And so I was sitting there going, oh, okay, why is everything I've heard about this person bad fruit? Like if it's all bad fruit, what does that mean about the tree? It's not good, right? And here Paul's looking out and he's going, okay, 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 okay. And now, now I want to give this person a chance to, you know, whatever, defend themselves, all that kind of stuff. But, but that was what was running through my head. Paul's saying, check my record. He says, our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Now, when he talks about those things, the air, the impurity, or any attempt to deceive, Paul is clearly here contrasting himself to um, insurrectionist leaders or, or any leader who doesn't have integrity. He's saying we did have integrity, and, and, uh, and there are others out there who didn't, and how did they not have integrity? Well, one of these three, three things. He says uh, there are those out there who have air. What is air? Air is the wrong information presented with belief that it's correct. That's what error is, right? Like when a baseball player makes an error, right? What are they doing? They were trying to make the right play, but they didn't. Okay, and so there's an element in here where there's a little bit of grace in error. And so sometimes you'll see famous pastors, and uh, this is kind of a hot topic right now, and they'll make a pretty um, bold error. Okay, again, I'm saying an error. You wanted to do the right thing, but because of a lack of information, you messed up. What's, how do you... How do you resolve? How do you get back to integrity in that moment? You admit it. You admit it. And you, you have to admit it at the same scale and the level that you committed it. That's integrity, right? Sometimes people will make a big mistake uh, out loud in public, and then they'll, they'll want to try to correct it with a small group. Well, if you made a big error in public, you have to correct that. That's integrity, right? And so um, sometimes, and I'm sure at some point in my life, I'm going to have to stand in front of you guys and go, wow, I said this, and it wasn't right, and I'm sorry. It was an error. 
right? Okay, Paul was smarter. So the air there, I can say there's forgiveness in that if you own it, right? Okay, the next one he says, or impurity, or impurity. Now here's, here's I was looking this up. Here's impurity. Impurity is correct information, but with a bad motive, but with a bad motive. You ever heard somebody like, they're, they're, listen, what they're saying is right. I still don't trust it, right? Something in your spidey sense is just going off. Like, I, it, it is right, but I just don't know if I trust it still. I have a friend. When I was out, I'm like, what do you think of Elon Musk? He's like, I love everything he does. Don't trust the guy at all, right? I'm not making any statement on Elon, right? He, the, that's what he's saying. He's like, I just don't trust him, right? He's like, he's, you know, he's, in, he's the Antichrist, right? He's pretending, okay? Impurities, correct information, bad motive, Right? This is the manipulator, the con artist, right? Could be any of those. Number three, um, uh, the last one he says is actual attempt at deception, which is incorrect information intentionally presented like it's correct. This is the worst one. This is the charlatan. This is the person you want to stay away with. The, right? This is the, the leader who comes up. They know what they're saying is wrong. They're abusing the gospel. They're manipulating the gospel. Um, they're, uh, they're doing something that is it's not biblically accurate. They know it's not biblically accurate, um, but they're still manipulating it in such a way to gain influence, gain power, gain attraction, all of those kind of things. And Paul is saying we didn't do any of those things. Right? But... Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, which is like the most alarming line for any person in ministry leadership ever to read. Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Whew. So we speak. Here's the motive underneath. Not to please man, but to please God. Who what? Who tests our hearts. Where's Paul getting at with that? What's he saying? This is what he's saying. He's saying, listen, guys, even if I fool all of you, right? I can say this for myself. Even if I trick all of you, right? Even if I fool, oh, he's doing it for the right reason. Blah, 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 I make you believe all this stuff, right? And like, and like which I, dear Lord, I pray to God that I am, right? But let's say I wasn't, all right? If I trick all of you, what's Paul saying at the end? You ain't gonna trick God. And it doesn't matter if I trick every person here. It doesn't matter if somebody's got the largest YouTube ministry, TV ministry, preaching ministry, whatever it might be. He can trick lots of people to make lots of money and to buy a jet and to do everything else. But guess what? Still got to stand before God. Still got to stand before God. Let me tell you, you can try to trick anyone. You can try to trick your kids. You can try to trick your spouse. You can try to trick yourself. You can try to trick us. You can try to trick, oh my gosh, they're promoters. Oh, they love Jesus. Oh, they're following. Oh, they're doing the rest of their, nah, nah, nah. Guess what? You still got to stand before God. You're still going to have to stand before him. He's, he tests your heart. He tests your heart. Remember what David said? Test me, oh Lord. Test me. Some of you, you hated that kid in class. Oh, I love tests. David wrote it in the Bible. He's like, David, God, I love tests. Test me. You're still going to stand before him. So insurrectionist leaders have to operate with integrity, but insurrectionist followers do too. We just got to operate with integrity. If we think we can try and trick anyone, we're still going to have to stand before him. Verse 5 and 6. For we never came... With words of flattery, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed, God is witness. I like on that one. He's like, God is my witness. Right? Why? It's hard to measure greed. It's, isn't it? It's hard to measure greed. Right? There's a lot of rich people that are greedy. There's a lot of poor people that are greedy. Greed has nothing to do with how much money you have. Right? There's a lot of rich people who are not greedy at all. And a lot of poor people who are greedy and call the rich people greedy because they're greedy and they want what the rich person has. Right? So then that one, he's like, God is my witness because this one's hard to measure. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Insurrectionist leaders reject or repent of false motives. 
an insurrection, his followers must do the same. We must, we must be able, God's going to test us, so that's a, good, that's a good motivation to test our motives, right? God knows, right? But in our own lives, you ever, like, pray about something, and you're praying about it, and, like, uh, like you're speaking the words, but you don't even believe them yourself? You're like, dear Lord, I just want to win the lottery because I really want to help people. That's it, Lord. And like you, right? We pray these prayers sometimes, and we're trying to convince ourselves, right? But the, the motive's still underneath. The motive's still underneath, okay? And, and listen, this is not to suggest that success is bad or that we can't want it or like it or even be ambitious or anything like that, okay? It's just rightfully doing it. And here are the things that he says we have to reject and repent of along the way. He says three things that we have to reject and repent of. The first one, flattery. Flattery. What is flattery? Flattery is a form of lying that attempts to get people to like what we say and make them feel good about themselves and us based on our insincere compliments. That's flattery. We use flattery when we don't say what we really think, but we say what we think they want to hear that will make it more advantageous for us in our relationship with them. That's flattery. Paul says, we didn't use flattery. We didn't just walk in and say, all right, hey, say these nice things there. We're going to just say these. Oh, Thessalonica, you're my favorite city. Oh, I'm in a rally in Detroit. I'm going to talk with a different accent. Okay. (laughs) We didn't use flattery, right? We came in. He said, we just said what we needed to say. We said what we needed to say, right? And we meant it. Number two, greed. Greed. Wrong word. Number two, greed. Okay, and of course, we get this one, and he's, of course, particularly talking about the context of ministry. Um, this can't be, we, we can't forget what Paul later says in 1 Timothy when he's like, a worker deserves his wages, and, and so it's not like, you know, that the money can't be associated with ministry. There's an appropriate level and all of that kind of stuff, right? That, again, yes, the labor is, is worth his wages, all that. Don't, don't tread out the ox and everything like that. Okay, but there's a difference between fair compensation and greed, and so he just says, you, you can't be greedy. You, you can't get into ministry to be greedy. You can't, be, uh, you can't do what you do for the kingdom of God uh, driven out of greed. And so he says you got to reject that one too. Number three, glory. Glory. I actually think this one's like probably the easiest one to fall into. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. When he was talking about you or others, here's what he was talking about, internal or external. What he was saying is this, I didn't try to make myself um, uh, a hero or, a, you know, a cult following inside. I didn't just preach to the choir. I didn't just preach to the choir uh, and say all of the things that everyone would have wanted me to say so that the choir will look and go, oh, that's our leader. He's our director. He didn't preach to the choir, he's saying. I didn't see glory internally, right? Uh, and then the second thing he's saying is I didn't, I, didn't, um, I didn't preach for external glory either. In other words, I'm going to say certain things because then there will be people out there that will look in and go, wow, look at you. Look at what you're doing, right? We got we to gotta watch ourselves in this. We have to watch ourselves in this individually. We have to watch ourselves in this, um, uh, you know, I, like, like corporately, whatever, as a church, all of these types of things. That, that it, it can't be about that. It can't be about, all right, like internal or external glory in any way, right? Um, every once in a while, you know, like the Lord will just convict me. And so, like, it was a, not, a, I mean, a lot, but in a particular way. Um, and, 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 and the Lord convicted me. It, it was probably about two weeks ago. I was, I was on social media and I was flipping through something and I saw something and it kind of made me angry, right? And it made me angry in a very sinful way, quite honestly. And so, like, the Lord was just like, okay, hey, idiot, um, take some time off, right? And so I was like, all right, you know what? I need to get off of social media for a couple weeks um, because. Like, there's, there's something stirring underneath that isn't healthy. There's something stirring underneath that, that I, don't, I don't want it to be my motivation, right? I don't want to preach to the choir. I don't want to seek the, the praise of other people, right? And guys, we, we've all got to do this. We've all got to look at it and go, what am, I, what am I really about? What am I doing right now? What am I, wh- why am I following the Lord? What, what, why am I sacrificing? Why, what, what is this really about? We've got to be aware of all three of these, and then we've got to reject all of them. All right? Verse 7 and 8. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. 
in a second, uh, in verse 11, he says, for you know how like a father with his children. Isn't it interesting? He hits both of them in like six verses. A nursing mother and then a father. He hits them both. Right? He's talking about that um, uh, kind of that two sides of the, of the pastoral relationship that he's talking about. Right? But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. I can definitely be honest. Lindsay is much more gentle when she nurses the kids than I am. <laughs> but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you <laughs> not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us, very dear to us. Um, I know. <laughs> I meant with a bottle. All right. Um, He's talking, he said at the end here, Paul's saying that the, the insurrectionist leader has to remember that although you're leading an insurrection, you have to operate with compassion and selflessness and genuine love for those that they influence. And all of us have to remember, we're part of a growing church, there's a lot to do. There's much to do. There's much, there's action. There's ways to serve. There's ways to get involved. All of us have our own things out there that we're building and we're doing and we want to build this. We want to do it for the kingdom and all of this kind of stuff. And at the end, Paul just kind of wraps it back up in this insurrectionist mindset. He goes, yeah, but, 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 but. Remember what was underneath? It was a deep love, compassion, genuineness, selflessness for people, for people. In um, April, I got the opportunity to go down to Nashville, and um, I was a part of this group of like 10 to 15 pastors at this conference, and, um, and we got to meet the host pastor, and um, I'd never even heard of this guy, I'm just being quite honest, um, but I got there, and their church is, I want to say this right, I think it's 300,000 square feet. That's stupid big, right? Like, you just, like, you just walk, and you just keep walking. Right? And I've been doing this for 30, 40 years now. Right? His name's Alan Jackson. And, um, and, and, and we, you know, so we got to meet him, and we're sitting there in his, like, I mean, his office is, like, as big as the auditorium. Right? And, um, and but, it, but it was funny, because he, he made to point out that nine times in his career, um, he, had, he has given up his office and, um, and gone back to a closet as the church has grown. I'm like, I don't. Just to meet you. you know, a man who's in his 60s and has been doing this for 40 years and has sacrificed like a, a big office, whatever. Right? So I don't want to I'm paint a false picture. Um, but we're sitting in this room, and it was fun because he's talking, and he's talking about this. And I mean, and, um, I, I, I thank God that like, you know, eight, ten years ago, like God just killed this in me, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but he's sitting in a room that would be easy to, en to be envious of, and 28-year-old me would have been like, this is it. This is the pinnacle, right? Um, and, and I'm sitting in there and, and uh, watching him, you know, over this whole thing. I can't even imagine what their budget is, right? They've got chairs set up all outside. It says every weekend we bring in a, um, to our church, we bring in, like, uh, uh, we have a concert. I'm like, well, who was last week? Chris Tomlin. It's like, who's next week? It's like the biggest names, right? They just bring them in to lead worship for a weekend, right? And, um, and we're sitting there talking. He goes, I'll tell you what the most important I'll tell you what the most important time of, of, my, of my week is. He says, every service, 20 minutes before, 20 minutes after, I stand in the lobby, and whoever wants to talk to me, I talk to him. And he says, because it's about the people. That's what it's about. And he just went around the room, he looked at all of us who are in our 30s and our 40s, and he just said, when you forget it's about the people, just quit. Because you're not doing the job anymore. You're not doing the job anymore. Right? And we've all got to remember that. It, it, in the end, there's all these plans and this insurrection, this big thing. But it's about individual people. It's about knowing people. It's about church being a family. It's about genuine care and compassion. It's about remembering someone's name. Right? 
It's about praying for someone and actually praying for them when you say that you're going to. It's about checking in. It's about doing that. It's about people. That's what he said. He said, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you. We were ready. We, by the way, so it's plural. Paul's like, I can't do this alone. Right? I can't do this alone. We were ready to share with you not only the gospel. In other words, he's saying, it's not enough just to be a good preacher. It's not enough. You, you can preach the paint off the walls. It's not enough. It's not enough. He says, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own selves. Why? Because you had become very dear to us. Because he loved them. He said, these are my people. This is why I do this. He didn't forget. And we can't either. We can't if our church gets bigger. We can't if we have to go to three services. We can't if we have to build on someday. We can't if we have to launch a church somewhere else. We can't, we can't, we can't forget. It's about people. That the true insurrection is not an insurrection if you lose all the people along the way. I was talking to somebody the other day. I told them this. I said, I had the rare privilege of preaching to 8,000 people when I was 25. Most people don't get to do that. I'm just being honest. I said, I was just, I'm being honest. I said, most people don't get to do that. I said, statistically speaking, I preached to the largest crowd I will ever preach to when I was 25 years old. You know? So there's like a, there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a line chart out there that shows like my preaching crowds and it's like, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, what happened to that dude? Right? I said, um, I'll tell you what. I said, it's way better. It's way better. And I was talking about the movie theater days. I said, it's way more fun to preach to 150 and hang out with 10 of them afterwards than to preach to 8,000 and go home. I said, as long as you're in ministry and as long as you're doing this, you can't forget that. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you forget about the people along the way. And I would say the same is true for each of us in here, guys. Doesn't matter how busy you get around here. Doesn't matter how, how much you do, how much you give, how much, whatever it is that you're leading or whatever you're doing outside of this church, all of that kind of stuff, if you forget about the people along the way. This is a Spurgeon quote. I thought, no, it's not Spurgeon, it's Calvin. John Calvin. In the meantime, we must bear in mind that all that would be ranked among true pastors must exercise this disposition of Paul to have more regard to the welfare of the church than to their own life and not be impelled to duty by a regard to their own advantage, but by a sincere love to those to whom they know that they are conjoined and laid under obligation. And I think that's true of all of us. All right, let's pray. Then we're going to take some questions. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, just for beautiful text, Lord, and it's challenging, and it's convicting, it's encouraging, um, it's kind of heartwarming, Lord, I just thinking about the family that you give us in the body of Christ. It's easy to get our minds and out there all the time. What's going on out there? What, what, are, what are they doing? What, what's happening over there? Why aren't you doing more here? I think of Peter at the end of the book of John, where he says, what about John. Jesus just looks at him and says, you worry about yourself. And so, Lord, help us to worry about ourselves. Each of us individually. Us as a church. But as we worry about ourselves, what we mean, Lord, is that we're, we want to take care of our own selves so that we might be able to love each other well. So, Father, I pray you would take this teaching tonight as only you can, plant it into our hearts, make us really good at following you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for today's message. For more information, you can visit Experience Redemption on Instagram or Facebook for updates, service times, and ways you can get connected. Want to partner and support the work of Redemption Church? You can give online at experienceredemption.com slash give online to explore your giving options. 
We also stream services on both YouTube and Facebook Live, so be sure to join us and share your redemption experience. Thanks for checking out the podcast. We will see you soon.